first day of winter. So I'm going to go down again, as always, just find the mood board. Uh, yeah, so this is the third go. place or highly commended, uh, I think it was called on the rookies, right. is their way of doing it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just to so everybody knows and also the people not watching live at, at some point, hopefully. Um, so yeah, this is third place winner of the, um, of the challenge itself. Are we going to focus mainly on the things that could, on the problems? Because obviously they're all winners. They're, they should know that they're great. Um, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say it. Obviously, it's fine. Okay? We can say that the images are good, of course. But I just want to remind people that even though we're giving a lot of critique on some of these images, keep in mind, we're, you're all, we took your images and reviewed them for the feedback here because we thought that there's actually huge potential and there's just these great examples of maybe not what to do or what could be better and so on. So we're trying to, you know, find something interesting to talk about in general. I agree. And I think that's what was the point of this feedback anyway, to help people to get to the next level, help them to improve their work. And I think that's the best way of, you know, just doing it. Um, so let's talk about now, um, I think he's got two different, it's the daylight and the nighttime. Doesn't look like a night time. We can talk about this soon. Uh, but yeah, let's start with the daytime if you guys want. A lot of volumetrics yeah. in the light. There isn't, for me, in the daylight version, there isn't actually that, there's not that much that I would change in the image itself. I actually like this image. This is a great image. I feel like one of the main things with this entry, so not the image, but the whole entry in itself, is the lack of difference between the night or the, the two different moods, basically. They're very similar. And the main idea with the challenge was to create two different moods. And that's even a little bit more weird because they're, I think they're named daylight and nighttime. So when you're looking at the other image, that you're not, necessarily nice thinking story. nighttime. I agree, with, I agree with you. It's a nice story. Uh, I really like the seamless. Yeah, and it's, it's, you, a, it's you, a decent composition and everything. Position. Yes, there is a moment there. and But then what did you come to the night shot? It doesn't have this night feeling. I mean, I was so... The, the light inside the building is just a pure white, super bright material. It's supposed to be like a warm, low light, create a mood, create a feeling. And you're right, I agree with you. There's no difference between them, like a huge difference between, it should be a difference between night and day, right? But I don't feel it. And Usually there are. There are, yeah. But, yeah. and then there is this, I don't know, it looks like a stone in the pavement, in the, in the road. I mean, before it was like a snow, but now it feels like there is a stone. I don't know if something went wrong or if you just start from here and you improve your work because this looks better to me as well. I agree with Nicholas. Um, so yeah, it doesn't have this night feeling and there is some weird things happening, like the lighting inside from me, like it's just pure white material. That's what I feel. <laughs> There's nothing yeah, my, help me to see a night moment. My, my yeah. biggest, my biggest uh, problem with this, the nighttime scene is just the atmospheric fog, how bright that is. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I, I mean, unless there is like Times Square. <laughs> around the corner yeah, right exactly there's <laughs> um, light everywhere <laughs> where is that light coming from but even times square there's like there's there's billboards there's colorful lights yes. right so you would see colors bleeding into that um but since we don't see that i would say that don't do that <laughs> there's distract from your focal point right so don't do that that's um i i'm just surprised where that bright light is coming from and for me that's the biggest issue with the nighttime lighting uh, yeah. so yeah i would definitely i would i would get rid of that i would get rid of that just let it fall into darkness if this is supposed to be nighttime again don't be afraid to let things fall into darkness. It is okay. <laughs> um, again, less is more. <laughs> less is more. I think we're going to brand this class, this session, less is more. I think it, I love it the way you said it. And, but yeah, I think, I think you know what to do, you know, yeah. get back in the cement. Apply it could be ideas. depending on what happens with the atmospherics on especially the nighttime there might be there might become a bit of an issue with the snow particles in the air as well because they get very noisy uh so there's a lot of stuff going on but it might work i mean it's it almost works right now and it works pretty okay on the daylight version especially because it's not fighting as much but they're a bit brighter here in the nighttime i think because of some of the like there's more shadow and if the 
I, I would be careful about if, if you're lowering the volume fog on an image like this or the volume light from, from the atmospherics, that the snow would be maybe a bit too intense. So, you know, I would just keep an eye on that. It might not be an issue, but it, it might be. So it's just, a, a, and then, you know, there's, I think Nikos and I, we talked a little bit about this image uh, beforehand. And there is a funny thing about, there's two different versions of the same scene. So the left side of the image is different from one image to the other. I go back there's, Like now. stairs. And then yeah. suddenly there's a metro uh, with some other things. So it's not, so it seems as if one started with, you know, one scene and then for some reason redid some of it maybe or in a different stage just ended up remembering oh right i have this other one that happens to look a little bit like nighttime so i'll call it that and then i have the two entries that might actually be a thing that happened i don't know um but yeah it's it's a small that's i don't care about that detail in as an entry itself that's fine but you know it's just i we just noticed it that's all <laughs> <laughs> okay so but it's a great entry i love the story yeah definitely it. definitely a great entry absolutely yes. um so number two a winter evening oh my god this is so emotional uh, I, I really like the feeling of these images uh, but let's see uh, the mood board uh, and there is something that i want to mention here that inspired me and when i see it i'm always like yes that's how it's supposed to be so these artists, I'm going to find what I'm talking about. I'm going to find the reason that I, I was so inspired by this work. I love when people sketching their ideas. I love when you write things down on paper. Do you know what they say? 40%, you have 40% more chances to succeed on your goals or on your sketches and your ideas if you put them down on paper. And I think that's true. It happened to me in the past. And I think everybody should do it in, in paper when you have skills to sketch. And when I was looking on the notes, of the task that she needs to do. And I was like, wow, or he or she, I don't know. But this is amazing. Like, see, sorry, the artist writing about the mood, writing about the set design, the lighting, that's inspiring to me. I think that we should talk about this and people that should start creating images by sketching their ideas or writing down their ideas. I think that's very, we don't see it often. And I would like to mention about this. So if I found now the mood board, another great thing, separating the stuff that you want to talk about. So basically, the color scheme and the structure is one mood board. The lighting and the character is a different mood board. And I really like the way you look on things differently and you don't put them all in one. Separation between your story, finding about the lighting and the mood or your character, your design, mm -hmm. design references, mood references, everything is so clear. It's a very successful process. And I was very inspired by this entry. I, I can feel the light. I can feel the mood. I know where it's going already. And that's a winner. If you know where the image is going before you start making and you have your sketch, you have your ideas, you will succeed. And I think that's why it's, it's a very successful entry. I mean, look at the sketch. Experimenting with the lighting, like the sun direction, the volumetrics, the window light, where the camera is going to be. That's inspiring. But it says a lot about who you are as a person, right? And how your yes. brain works. So if you ever go on a job interview, by the way, this kind of stuff is good to have as a supplement because that tells whoever is interviewing you, you know, having been on that side, that, okay, this person thinks through, you know, you're analytic, you're organized, which tells me that if I give you a deadline, you're more than likely going to meet that deadline. So these are all good pluses to have. So just a little side note. Uh, if this is if this is you, if this is in your personality, obviously, if this is not you, that's fine. You don't have to be that way. But if this is you, and I happen to be that person, I have sketches and I have lists. I have multiple lists, sometimes too many lists. Um, <laughs> but, but if you do, bring that up in a job interview because it yeah. definitely is a plus and it says who you are as a person, how you attack a problem. So it's a big exactly. bonus. Exactly. And the detail of the scene as well is very impressive. And it's done in Blender, by the way. And um, so when you see the, like the clay render, I think, I mean, look at this detail. Just everything is so well done. Yeah, I mean, look at this. It's so much detail there. But everything is came from the sketch. Everything came from the idea. I don't think you can succeed making such a scene without know, knowing what you're making, you know? So everything was clear from the beginning, from the mood board, from the sketch, from the, from the notes. 
And that's the only way you can get such a great mood and quality of light. So yeah, I'm truly inspired by this work. And I think magical. It's, it's magical. It's, it's, it's magical. So, and what I like about also is that there is, yes, there's a lot of detail, but you're not afraid to let some of it kind of fade away, right? It's not, the detail is there, but you're not afraid to focus on what's really important. You can always add renders later on to a project. Obviously, this project, we asked for two renders on a mood board, basically. Yeah. Um, but it's okay to do more, obviously. You can always add like 500 more renders if you wanted to, in theory. Even some people actually added animation and, and did a YouTube video and everything, which is great. I love that. Um, but if you end up adding detail and having done work that doesn't get to be shown as much as maybe originally intended through your planning or whatever, for whatever reasons, you know, you can always go back and do more renders, like give them justice, give the, the work you put into your models, actually get them, you know, give them their own space. If, if there's room for it later on, it might not even be through this challenge itself. It could be through like, if you have a art station or rookies profile or whatever you're using for your portfolio, you know, add some more to the entry itself and and this entry in itself it's there's a million things in it i i agree with me because there's it, it's really an homage to what pre-production can do for a final production and that is like <laughs> i think that's the hardest thing for me to get my students to really understand is how much you gain by using your time on pre-production before actually going into production you can make so much more faster even though you're, it feels like you're taking away time from your production time, but you're in, in, in fact, you're not really doing that. I can see it, Sonia. <laughs> um, well, I, ca I come from Hollywood, so I actually worked on set. So if you have a successful pre-production, your production is going to run well. If yeah. you cut your pre-production time short, if it's not successful, if you don't do your planning properly, you're going to be screwed in production. You're going to spend so much more money, so much more time. So no, no, take your time plan it, make those lists, <laughs> even if you hate them, different ways of doing it. You can put pictures on that, doesn't have to be text, <laughs> but really plan it out. What do you need? What assets do you need to create? What materials? What's your lighting plan? What's your story? What are your focal points? Write it all out so you know you have a plan and then just go in and execute. Yeah. That's how you do it. Do blog outs, do sketches, do whatever you need. Um, get your composition tied in before actually going into production itself is a huge help by not overdoing work. Like this person might as well have ended up, could have ended up doing way too much work on the lamp in the middle of the scene because the, the idea was maybe there from the beginning that, oh, I want this beautiful lamp that should create the warmth from uh, for this character in the night version. So it would be tempting if you just had that main idea to just go straight into production and start creating a, a, a lamp for the next five days. But instead, your blog out would tell you that it's not really that lit up. It's it's lighting up itself, but you can't actually see that lamp in most situations. So this could be a box with two cylinders in it, and I wouldn't be able to see that. And if it's much more than that, and we're never going to show it, it's a waste of time, basically. So that's, that's what pre-production will do for you in the end. Yeah, generally, I start off with doing blackout meshes. I, uh, I do my set dressing in my scene. I do a basic lighting pass. I figure out my camera angles. And that right there does exactly what you said, Nicholas. It tells me, what am I going to see? What's in the foreground? What needs a lot of detail? What doesn't? What falls away? And which yeah. assets do I never use? Yeah. Don't need to bother with them. I mentioned the, the deer as a cardboard cutout. There's actually nothing wrong with doing cardboard cutouts. I, I need to mention this because Sonia's here and she used to live <laughs> doing cardboard cutouts, basically. Um, matte painting? It's called matte painting. Just want to mention Yeah, exactly. That. That's, a technical, that's a technical term. <laughs> matte painting, exactly. So it's, and there's definitely nothing wrong with it. You just need to know if it's background, foreground, middle ground, whatever. So you actually know the detail that of, you know, the, yeah, the detail you need to go for. And, and if it, if, are you ever going to see that it has depth or not? Even there, there's, that's why we have matte painting artists. Like it's, it's a huge time saver instead of, you know, modeling a huge mountain or background or whatever to do backdrops and all of these crazy things, you know, just, just do 
cardboards. Fine. Not penny. Not, not okay. cardboards. <laughs> not cardboards. <laughs> I, I do. Have, I do have one one bit of feedback on this image, though. Yes, please, uh, Nicholas. And uh, I'm uh, sorry, Nikos. Can you can you can you zoom in on this at all? Is that possible oh, on the nighttime see. scene? Uh, let me see. On the nighttime, I can't zoom in. I can't, I can't zoom in. Yes, I was okay. looking for another image. Yeah. The 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 material of the foreground um, uh, fern. Yeah. That material needs a bit uh, of work. Yeah. That material needs a bit of work. Um, it's very reflective. Uh, the bump on it is very, very strong. Uh, take a look at your foliage again. Uh, you know, add some translucency to it and reevaluate the specularity aspects of it. Um, fern again. I don't have a green thumb, so I don't have any. I don't. I, I kill plants, so I don't really have plants in here that I can look as references. But top of my head, my thing would say that they're not that. They're very thin and they're not that reflective. That's it. Actually. I can add a little bit to that as well, because that fern is the only, or not the only, but that's the main thing um, I had notes on as well. Um, and I do agree with the, I think I, I kind of called it out and, and guessed that this fern might actually be an asset and not modeled uh, in its own right. It might be, it might not be, but for me, it kind of looks like an asset. It kind of has that generic vibe to it that it could be used in any scene so it kind of looks like a downloaded asset to some degree and it also again it's fine if it's not but um so it's it, it's kind of weird that you have this diagonal line on the fern that where the light hits the fern itself it's a very straight line on a organic f flower fern whatever plant and that line in itself also lines up a little bit too much with the with the rope hammock itself from the from the back of the character, which creates this weird space between the fern and the back of the character, with the two diagonal lines lining up like this, basically. So that that creates this weird space in this one image. If you go to the other image, though, you can see the the composition itself is exactly the same but the lighting is so different that you don't get that diagonal line issue as you did before. And those are the, um, actually the same line, kind of lines we were talking about earlier with the tree and the hole, um, where if something accidentally almost lines up, stuff needs to either line up or don't line up at all. It's the same kind of rule. Um, so the fact that it kind of lines up makes it look like it's a bit on purpose. And then it, then it, it kind of, it messes with me a little bit. Gets a bit too much attention, I guess, maybe. So, yeah. Exactly. And the attention is will always be on the character. So, yeah. It's, it. it's a very small thing. It's very nitpicky. Yes. Yeah. If, if you want to go picky, yeah, but it's all about oh, we do. We do. That's what exactly. we do. Though. We do. That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're here for. That's what we're we do. We're here to provide <laughs> feedback and be picky. And uh, the winner, the number one winner the final winner so this is the entry um i'm gonna go down again find but you can always resist right away that there's this huge difference between them which is great but let's find the mood board and see where, where everything started uh you can see the lighting as well is there a mood board yeah there is so that's one Yeah, beautiful, nice style. You can feel the separation between the worlds in the mood board, and you can also feel it on his final images. I think that that was a successful thing. It's more stylized, different kind of images, right? Yeah. So if I go back now and start with the daylight scene. Okay, there you are. So. All right. So I kind of feel already fired up. Um, <laughs> I really, I want to say, I really love these two images. I love the feel of them. They really have this vibe to it. It's kind of, you know, it's, first of all, I love the fact that it's not photorealism. And, and you know, I, I do that. <laughs> I teach doing stuff like that for a living. So I, I kind of try and get people to do photorealism and, and, you know, it gets, I wouldn't say boring, 
necessarily. It's very usable in so many different things. But I think that just that just makes it so much so much more interesting for me when it's when it's more fantasy, when it's more cartoony, or has a a visual art style in some in whatever direction. And that makes it a little bit more interesting, at least for me. Um, the pre-production work that we are allowed to see in this post is a lot less than it was on the other post. And, and we don't actually know how much work was done beforehand. And, and if there is actually that much pre-production, it's hard to tell in, a, in an entry like this. Um, hopefully there was done some um, to achieve this. So it's not on accident, but at least the entry is very close up to what the mood bots tell us. So that's a really good, you know, it's a good start. Um, there is a, a, a detail I'd love to uh, just mention that I actually noticed straight away with on the, um, sorry, the, the test renders we're getting beforehand on the entry itself. And that's the fact that this person added just a little bit of camera distortion, lens distortion to the scene itself to make it a little bit more cinematic. It's not much and it can only be seen you would only notice it if you actually go through the sliders themselves, but it is distorting the images just ever so slightly. And, you know, to the naked eye, you might not actually miss it if it wasn't there, but it's just, it's just adding this one small little thing. It also takes away some sharpness, uh, usually on your renders. So it's a good way to just getting rid of that very CG, too perfect sharpness, which is a very common thing to that can be hard on even photorealism as well, to actually get rid of. Um, so that's a good way to do that, or that's a way to do that. There's many ways to do it. Um, that, that's actually something we didn't mention on some of the other entries. Uh, a lot of the other entries that we've looked at previously, I actually feel like they went through a sharpen filter, and actually that just takes away from the realism of the, of the images as well. So yeah. I think that's a nice, nice thing that you brought that up. I'm, I meant to, I just forgot. So yeah. yeah. Rather in, okay. That's a, that's a, that's, um, you could say rather blur than sharpen your things, but I wouldn't, yeah, it, yeah. it also, it very much depends on what you're going for, but yes. usually the main issue on any 3d rendered when you're beginning would be you have too much sharpening going on in general. Yeah. Things are way too clean, way too sharp. Um, so you need to find a way to take some of that sharpness out and a lens correction of some sort, uh, even in your post-processing, if you're using Photoshop or Affinity or whatever program you're using, that could be a really good way to do that. You obviously want a clean, sharp image if you're going for something very customer product design kind of thing, but it still needs to not be overly sharp. It, it's, it is one of the main things I feel like most people battle to try and get you know, the last 2% of your image. Yeah, there's a difference between sharp and clean, right? So yeah, clean yeah. means absolutely no render artifacts, nothing like that. So make sure you have a clean render. But then uh, you also, yes, you want some sharpness there. It should not be all overall soft. But if you crank that up too much, if you push that too far, it looks... It looks 2D again. You're taking yep. away that realism, that realistic aspect of it. So it, it is it is a fine balance, and it's sometimes hard to figure that out. But uh, basically, that's why... Sonia is saying less is more. Less is more. <laughs> I, 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 I want, I want my t-shirt. I want you guys. By Sonia, guys. less is more. That's it. I'm getting that's a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I warned you guys I was going to say this a lot, but that's it's it is a fine balance. And if you're not sure what it is, I would say always show the image to if you have kids, show yeah. them to your kids. <laughs> kids are brutally honest. They will tell you what looks better, what doesn't. That's a good advice. I like it. Yeah. yeah. The lighting itself is what stands out for me in this image. It's the mood of that lighting. Yeah. Uh, I love the backlighting, especially on the nighttime from the moon. And you have this very cold, white, very clear silhouette on the image going on. That's that's really what works for me, together with the warm lighting, which really makes this image cold, is the contrast that you have the actual warm stuff, warm light there to make the image even colder outside. So mm -hmm. if there wasn't this cold light, if there's if, if that was too white or whatever, this wouldn't be as cold. You need the, the contrast, the complementary colors and all this going on. That's that's really what makes this work. And subtle small details like 
the footsteps going into the to the house it gives us you know spirals and diagonal lines to to look at and yeah it's it's all these great small things that really make there's this. also smoke you so you know there's a fireplace so you're yep. feeling safe and warm inside and it's perfectly balanced with the cold moonlight i think yeah. and we talked about this before like focus points and it's perfect because i can see that first focus point on the house and the moonlight is the second focus point that was the image with the deer i'm talking about we talk about this hierarchy yeah but it's a great feeling it's a great mood and it's I, I love it as well it's very well done and all these details with the footsteps it makes things more interesting and adds visual um interesting to the image you know and you get the direction from the light yep. you see that the moon is clearly the light source in the image whereas yes. when we looked at the, the the deer and the house scene yeah. again where is that light coming from that's everywhere when the moon is in the far back right and it's exactly. backlit so here exactly. you get the direction it's a nice example everything is like clearly explained like there is a <laughs> the the saying that goes you know explain it to me like i'm five that's a really good saying when you're talking about images as well it needs to be crystal clear what's actually going on uh if it's not if you had to guess that there oh it might be because someone is holding a flashlight behind the camp photographer or whatever you know that's a it has to be blatantly obvious what is going on that usually makes your renders your images work a lot better in general can i just talk about the snow on the trees you can isn't that just amazing doesn't you don't you just want to touch it and just kind of you want to definitely want that i know it's, it's don't you i mean it's amazing. Just amazing you can see even better in the night in the daytime scene yeah. um if you want to go back to that it's yes just, oh mean, look at that look at that yeah. it's just oh it's, so well kind of, it's stylized but it's stylized because so, it's it's not realistic it's because no. it, it it kind of reminds me of um in 3ds max it would be like the meta ball whatever it's called where blob mesh i think they call it um so kind of got that vibe to it but in a good way it, it it's this looks like the, this could be cotton a cotton field or some yeah it's um, I think I even mentioned to Nikos at some point when we we're talking a little bit about some of the images. The one thing I'm missing that could be just a tiny bit more in this in these images is the specular highlights of the individual crystals in the snow. There are highlights in the snow. There is actually like stochastic flakes or whatever is used, but I, just a little bit more. Just a little bit. <laughs> Not that much. Because it's, it's stylized, right? So you can increase that. You can crank up the drama just a little bit more no i agree just a yeah, little bit you've of those, seen the, the size of the moon yeah oh you know yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> but uh you know just like a little bit more of the ice crystals i agree would be really nice yeah. but i remember like, i remember oh. something else that nicholas was telling me on the meeting that he said um, about the detail how the snow blends and the mountain you know that this can be better and but then when you have such a nice moment you can get away sometimes with not having a nice detail, but he's right. It's not well done. It can be definitely be improved. Uh, but yeah, he succeeds so much on the moment of us looking on the, on the hero, which is the house, and you feel that you want to touch the snow. That's why you can get away by having, let's say, some mistakes on the background. You can get away because the moment is there. The feeling is there. The vibe is there. And that's, that's amazing. No. The blending of the snow and the mountains doesn't bother me. It's a style. Exactly. Scene. That's what it's, it can exactly be like. Is. That is that could be a stylistic choice. That's what we're that discussing. That doesn't bother that, me at all. Exactly because your moment is there and you can see it, but you just ignore it. Yeah. That's was what we discussed with him on two, on two days ago, and I think that's a good point because you know it's when everything is there, everything else you ignore. It's yeah. It's it's a beautiful image. Exactly. It's a beautiful. It's a beautiful image. image. Uh, I, I I do I do love the nighttime a little bit more though. That's my that's my, uh, that's my personal me. favorite. I same love for it. me. It's just even more moody and atmospheric, yes. and the balance of the uh, the color balance is just amazing. And the cold and warm, it's so emotional in moment. So yeah, I, I also like it a bit more. But I would say that they're both very very. They're both nice. beautiful, absolutely. And we so have a lot of nice pleasure. negative space. It all works well together. It's well done. Yeah, it they, it has that you know frozen disney kind of vibe to it right he, he, the person who made this obviously uh, juan lopez really made it come together by simplicity as well exactly it's great i think that was that was all of them yeah i mean we also on time that was i mean we're trying to make it like one hour plus yeah. Um, but yeah, congratulations to everybody. That was a very successful um, challenge. And also, we received 75 entrants, 38 schools, 
27 countries and almost 1,000 media uploads. That's amazing, guys. So thank you so much for all the students that they created this beautiful artwork for us to review and talk about. There were, I did spot a, diff, uh, um, a great question and I, I think maybe Sonia could be able to tell, to tell this one thing. Uh, I think it's Alexandra who's asking, what do you mean when you say negative space? Oh, yeah. If you feel taking that challenge, Sonia. <laughs> sorry, I had muted myself. Uh, sorry, okay. here we go. Uh, yes, no, negative space is basically the space uh, that's uh, surrounding your subject matter. So that space in between your um, your your characters or your uh, I don't know, focal points and then the space surrounding that, that's your negative space. So in this case, what we would consider a positive space is the house, the trees, the landscape, and then sort of the, well, some of the landscape. And then the negative space is basically the areas uh, surrounding that. So like the sky, for example, that would be your negative space. And then also some of the landscape on the bottom, right? That's sort of negative, right? There's nothing really happening. There's nothing. It's again, an area of rest, that sort of area. So I hope, I hope that explains it. Yeah. Cinematographers, they love to use negative space in cinema. Yes. You will see it very often <laughs> in photography as well. But and it's also something very, a term very common in art, uh, negative space. But we're, we're very well explained. So, yeah, it comes back to art fundamentals. It's just the, yes, the big exactly. fundamentals of Going composition. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Great. Wow. Amazing. Before we uh, um, say goodbye and everything, I just yes, wanted please. to ask people if they had any more questions that they wanted us to try and answer. We yeah, still have yes, um, a few minutes to give off if you. Uh, exactly. So, yeah. And also, if you have yeah. questions, you know uh about like uh, questions for us not maybe not not, not necessarily oh, yeah. related yeah, to yeah. the entries but if you have questions uh for us um yeah feel free. any questions really yeah let us know in the comments um otherwise we can just kind of well, hang out i have chat. a good feedback from <laughs> ina ina says that the speakers were so helpful and kind thank you ina appreciate it thank you for your comment thank you hopefully people you know the they have new ideas of how to approach their images. Hopefully they will go back on them. Hopefully they will still improve their work. Um, we all do it. You know, we always learning something new. We always trying to improve our work. It's part of the daily creative process, I guess. Yeah. We also really hope that you guys, um, well, we actually don't know if uh, all of you guys was following uh, live here, if you all enter the competition itself, but me and Nikos, especially uh, when we set out to create this challenge, this rendering challenge was, I guess the idea came about because we looked at what had been done already and we wanted to try and create our spin to what we thought a rendering challenge should sound like. What should it consist of? Um, so we're really, we're really glad to see how many people actually ended up joining the competition itself. And we can also probably... You know, just mention the fact that we are actually, we have already begun talking about creating a new challenge at some point. Yeah. It won't be for a while. It probably won't be uh, before summer at all because that's way too early. And also, yeah. you know, <laughs> the rookies have the rookies challenge, the rookies uh, um, ranking uh, awards and everything is, is actually going on right now. So it wouldn't make sense to, to you know, to do more of this. But yeah, we we are definitely talking about already uh, yes. some ideas on what what could we do next? Some new rules, some new twists on on the rendering challenge. If, if if it even is a rendering challenge, who knows? We're not really animators, so it's probably gonna be related to images, obviously. That's um, true. But I think we'll probably that, try and get Sonia on board again at that point. Oh, no, definitely, definitely. <laughs> Happy to be there. Gonna... Should we mention the rookies because well, aren't they and. In... They, oh, we definitely didn't mention them as a sponsor, oh, yeah, but yeah. yeah. I'm just saying the rookies, yeah. the, you know, yeah. if you're not participating, you should. Okay. <laughs> I've, I've dealt with the rookies a lot, uh, as in, in a positive way. <laughs> um, I have so many students from uh, our school who's been entering the rookies from year to year. And I hear so many great stories about what those students who've had entries at the rookies, what they've gotten out of it uh, so I can only give my warmest um, you know I, I would really recommend people to actually join the rookies if you're still a student if you're if you're new no matter how experienced you are or not as long as you're a student 
because that's, you know, then you're a rookie, um, you're eligible to enter. And there's so many different categories for the rookie awards. So there's bound to be something that fits everyone. There's 2D, 3D animation, there's um, visual effects, architectural visualization, you know, all of these great things. There's something for everyone. And you can, you can even enter multiple uh, categories if you want. And I think, Sonia, are you a judge again this year? You were last I year. I am. Yep, I am. Great. And I actually pulled up the, I pulled up the page. So I have dates. So oh, great. Entrance, uh, entries are open right now. So create an entry page and upload your best work. And you have until June 1st to do so. So you have some time. But uh, if you have some work, if you want to get it out there, if you want to, you know, open yourself up to get some feedback from people, I would highly recommend it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's very inspiring to see everybody, you know, see what people create. So definitely, if you have some work, you know, join it if you can. Double check the uh, eligibility, obviously. Uh, there are some categories or some um, requirements that you have to fulfill first. But if you can, join. It's going to be awesome. For sure. And yeah, it's a, it's a good way to get exposure as a student as well, to get some of your work out there. A lot of, you know, a lot of judges will see your work. <laughs> they kind of have to um, because they need to vote, vote on, on all the entries and, and all of these great things. So it is actually a good way of making yourself noticed. Um, I've, I've heard of students who had success stories who didn't even, they didn't even become finalists but they got contacted by judges and companies the judges represented afterwards because they were actually interested in the person, even though they didn't become a finalist or anything. Yep, we did. Yeah, even <laughs> yeah. we did. When you we say did. we, oh, so I mean, when I was working at the uh, at the uh, IO Interactive, we we IO Interactive, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah so people. that's a good, great point, right? I mean. It's a great way for the judges also to, to use it as scouting. I, I know a lot of you, a lot of the judges do that um, for a contest like that. I'm never probably going to be a judge for uh, the rookies, mostly because I'm a teacher. So that would be pretty unfair advantage, or at least it would seem like it. Um, so I'll have to create my own competitions to become a judge, which I did in this case. <laughs> so yeah. I knew that. Fun fact. I learned something yeah. today. I don't think I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but yeah, that's a, I would definitely, yeah, go submit, get, make entries. It's great fun and it's good practice as well. Did we figure out, was there any other questions? Um, I have one from Alan, which I think we have, it's good to, to respond to. Uh, in interiors, where the client wants the interiors to be full of elements, how do you improve the image composition with the camera rules? incorporate negative spaces. Also, some don't even like use of depth of field. Everything should be sharp and clear. Face lots of issues recently. Oh, yeah. that's a good uh, question. Very common on, on, on architectural, on architects wanting everything to be clear, everything they want to see, everything they want super wide lenses. Um, but again, I will say that, you know, we usually on a project, we try to create moments plus camera, camera composition with wide shots. Uh, I'm always looking on the guides. I'm always looking on the story from the day that I even start compositing. I don't add people's dent. So when you're composing, think about what do you want to show to your client and create different compositions with different lenses. I will start when I was working at WeWork. We usually start with a wide lens to present the space, like showing as much as we can. And then we create moments with a 35 lens, 50 lens, and we use depth of field there. So you know, experiment and try to explain them how real photography works. Use references and mood boards to represent your vision. It helped me over the years so much. It's the only way to get your clients to understand your vision and understand what photography is and why you want to use depth of field. If you don't have something to, to sell them your vision, then yes, they will never agree on depth of field or um, a 50 millimeter lens. So use references, create your vision, explain to them before you start producing and think about your story from the beginning, not at the end. And of course, I will get more people to, to add. There's a lot to talk about this. Because, uh, uh, sorry, you just made this answer and now went away. Because, uh, Alan, you mentioned actually a lot of a lot of questions that are couples. The depth of field is one, which I think I completely agree with you, Nico. So I think that's a great that's a great way to handle um, yeah. more challenging clients. Let's put it that way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, what I'm actually want to want to jump on is when uh, when the client wants the interiors to be full of elements. 
So when that's the case, because I mean, we just talked about this earlier, right? If you have too many elements, elements, it can be cluttered. It can be visually confusing. You don't know where to look. When that, when this is the case, I would say uh, try to cluster smaller or more multiple elements together. Think of them as little clusters, as little groups, and then look at the shape that they overall create. And then go back to your initial design elements, right? Think large, small, medium shapes, and then balance those out. So try to simplify it in your head. Try to simplify them visually, group them together, and then evaluate them based on it. Small, a lot of details, larger bigger, medium, how many shapes do you have? Make sure you have a nice shape balance, nice, nice contrast there. So that's my recommendation for that. Yeah, I agree. There, There is also maybe a little something to be said about when, depending on the type of client, obviously, but when you have clients, usually they're hiring you because you're the expert and they are the ones with a product they just want visualized to some degree. So it is also your responsibility as the expert to teach the client what is right and what is wrong in, in the end. They don't necessarily know themselves. They have all these great ideas with their own logo, with lots of stuff and going on and so on. And it, it sounds amazing on paper for the client, but the client doesn't know basic composition rules, all these great things that you should probably know. So you need to teach them. You need to show them sometimes, or at least talk them into a better idea somehow. It's, you know, it's, it's not that uncommon to, to, you know, take a fight <laughs> with a client from time to time in a, in a good way, of course, right? It's, um, they're hiring you guys. So, you know, you need to be the expert they hired. I think we have a few more questions thanks. here. Alan, say thanks for the lovely tip and explanation. Thank you, Alan, for asking this question. It was a very important question, actually. Yeah. Um, Michael, you're uh, asking if it's possible to get feedback from the ones you, we didn't do here on stream, uh, just written bullet points at some point, or just because you, um, you want feedback from all of us. Um, I can't talk for both Nikas and Sonia, but... Um, you're more than welcome to uh, to write to me as well. Um, I will. This will come up on uh, on video on demand on YouTube at some point, and I will add my details for my general contact details for where you can find me there. Uh, but I'm ca I'm also contactable on both LinkedIn and so on. So that would be a great way to um, to approach. Um, but I will let Sonia and Nikos answer for themselves because they might not have the same you know. Uh, uh, the only thing I would like to say, of, I think we all love to provide feedback, so feel free to send us a social media message or something. But don't forget, uh, join us on the Chaos Campus uh, group on Facebook. It's something new from Chaos, uh, and their vision is very strong. It's all about education. It's all about connecting the community globally and offer education and knowledge. Join us there because Nicholas is there. I'm there. I think Sonia is also there. Join us, send us your work live on the group and you will get advice from many professionals and many instructors, not just three of us. It's all about community, guys. I believe in communities and you should be involved in the communities. So Chaos Campus on Facebook, I will say it's a great community to start applying your work and all of us will be there as well, but plus many others. So let's all together be and growing this community. I will say this is a great thing. Plus, of course, you can send us a personal message at any time. You're welcome. Same here. Uh, I have, you can find me on my website. You can send me uh, my email uh, address is there, just soniachristoff.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. Uh, those are usually the ones if you want to get a direct message from me. Uh, I, I don't do direct messages on Instagram. <laughs> it, I got a little bit too flooded there. Um, but uh, you could do that. Uh, and also, um, I'm also on uh, another forum, uh, the Lightbox Expo forum. If you're not familiar with Lightbox Expo, that is a... Um, uh, a conference, uh, artist gathering, it's, uh, you know, everybody coming together um, and that's uh, organized by Schoolism, which is where I also teach. So that's another Discord server where you can reach out and there's a 2D category, there's also a 3D category and there's lots of people there. So uh, you can also do that. Uh, Ina, I think, thank you for, this is nice. Did you post the link for the Chaos Campus? Yeah, join us guys. Let's, let's continue the discussion that we started today here. I think that will be super exciting for all of us to continue talking together, you know? That would be amazing. 
we do one more question then wrap it up? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, Rishab, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing your uh, name correctly here. Um, you say that uh, you're a bachelor in student architecture and I'm planning for a job next year, but the situation of Indian market in this field is not so good. Any advice on how to apply for international firms and companies? I think it's very much the same way as it depends on your situation, actually. <clears throat> but it's the, the way you apply would be the same as in any other job. <clears throat> Sorry. Our, um, our way of this, this business, the 3D business in general, like architecture, VFX, it's all very international it, to begin with. So it would be probably the same way you would apply to any other job in the same field. Um, it, most companies, or not necessarily most, but a lot of companies I know of, um, no matter where they are, actually have their, uh, their the, the spoken language is actually English in most uh, companies I know of, even in Denmark. I know a lot of, in Sweden as well and Germany and so on. And a lot of them actually speak international with each other because there's a lot of artists from different countries who join in on these companies. Um, so it would be very much the same as it would any other place. Um, there might be some companies that would be open and looking more for uh, working at home solutions, um, but that would be a very that's very dependent on the companies and what their um, what their policies are. It's 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 changing a lot right now, so I can't answer on that in particular. So if you're able to work. If you're not able to move from India, you you would need to look up companies who have policies about working from home. Uh, if you want to work for a company in a different country without leaving, um, that can be a challenge, but not impossible. We have you know we see it all the time. I know Sonia, you probably had quite a few at IO. I could imagine who were um, working remote as well. Yeah, I'm um, doing it now. I have, uh, yeah. I'm doing it now. I have clients uh, in the States that I work for. I'm talking to clients in Japan right now as well. So yeah. I think it's, uh, uh, that's the one good thing <laughs> that's happened over the last couple of years is that uh, studios are more open to remote uh, working yeah. and p having people or, you know, working remotely. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's many studios actually look asking for people to be remote these days with the COVID situation. So I would say, you know, be brave enough, create a badass portfolio and send them open, you know, send them a nice message and ask for an interview. You never know. Just be brave enough to try. Even if it's the best company in the world, if that's your dream, follow your dream. Do your passion, yeah. do what you love, you know? I think you also did a great thing uh, just by, you know, putting your work out there uh, for these kind of competitions. Uh, like I said, the rookies put your work out there because people who work in the industry will see your work. And if it's good and they have a position open, they might just reach out to you. You never know. That would be the easiest way to get a job. So you don't even have to apply. You're just waiting for them to come. Obviously, if you're going for a job, search for it, you know, do, do, do the work, do the groundwork, actually reach out to companies. Don't be afraid reach out to artists as well. If you're, if you have a, an artist you're a fan of that you think is doing great work and inspires you or whatever, if you have questions, reach out to that artist. I can promise that on all artists' behalf on any platform, you can always reach out. We're all kind of the same in that way. And I've, I've yet to hear a bad story about someone who were new in the field, who reached out to their favorite artist and the favorite artist told them to, you know, bugger off or anything. I've never heard of that. But I do very often hear about people who reach out to their favorite artist and they answered and they got this almost, you know, great response and feedback or, or pointers in a direction even. Doesn't matter who it is. You know, we're all we're all here. I, I've heard a story, but I can't, oh, I don't, I don't want to okay. share it right now though. But yeah, I've heard a story. It does happen. All I'm trying to say is it does happen, but very, very rarely, um, very rarely. But also just keep in mind sometimes, uh, you know, uh, people get really busy. Uh, especially, you know, like once you get older and you have a family as well, right? Uh, so just if you don't hear back right away, uh, even from us, if you don't hear back for, uh, from us right away, like don't take that as a, as a like, you know, we don't want to, don't take it as a, like this was done intentionally. Just, you know, life sometimes runs away with us. So just keep that in mind. 
yeah, obviously, when I'm saying reach out, don't, you know, <laughs> don't, uh, don't keep spamming people. But, you know, yes. reaching out, saying hello, could never hurt in general. We will we'll, we'll definitely do our best to respond. So, yeah, please yes. reach out. Of course. And we'll, we'll do our best. Yes, absolutely. Okay, I feel love the answer. Amazing. I think, I think we've managed to get all the answers uh, and answer the questions. So, yeah. is that maybe time to say thank you to everyone? Yeah, thank you. So. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank everyone. you for joining us, guys. <laughs> uh, it was a great audience. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you for the rookies for organizing this amazing challenge. Uh, Nicholas mentioned that we'll have something new coming up, not too soon, but it's coming. We'll have a clear idea of what we want to make. We'll let you know later on. Uh, thank you, Sonia, for joining us. It was a pleasure. For having me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Nicholas, again, thank you yeah. for always a pleasure to collaborate with you you know that and we're always talking about finding new ways to work together and i think it's going to happen we always yeah. we're inspired one another and that's a great thing so it's great big thank you to everyone and we'll see you again very soon okay all right bye guys bye, bye everyone